It used to be that if you wanted to bore your friends and family, you'd just say the words, Iowa caucus, and they'd instantly fall asleep. Those words flash an image of endless fields of corn and the elderly yelling about Anderson Cooper needing to trim his hippie hair. This year, for at least 24 hours, the Iowa caucus was the most riveting thing in the world, and this was due to the fact that the caucus was thrown into chaos due to an app that was supposed to streamline the counting process. And despite this being a huge story that would clearly show you the corruption and the failure of our electoral process and the Democratic Party, we lost interest because of the State of the Union address. The second we know that Donald Trump is going to say a thing that may or may not form a sentence, we forget everything that actually matters. And then... The only thing we can focus on is the high school dramatics between Trump, Pence, and Pelosi. After the State of the Union address, the only thing the country could talk about was Pelosi ripping up the script. Some called it bold. Some called it disrespectful. I call it staged and egotistical. It's a distraction to veer us away from the real conversation of bipartisan support of imperialism and stealing our elections. During the State of the Union, Trump gave a shining endorsement to Juan Guaido, the false imperial leader of Venezuela. The second his name was said, Pelosi stood up and cheered and applauded. I mean, had the applause gone on for even 10 seconds longer, she might have thrown her underwear up to Juan Guaido in solidarity of his false reign. Trump claimed that the problem in Venezuela is Nicolas Maduro and his dictatorial reign, killing democracy for sport and for the Venezuelan people. This statement is wrong and foolish on so many levels. I mean, the election in Venezuela where the people legally elected Maduro among at least five different political parties is rated to be far better and fairer than America's elections. And no one's even heard of Guaido in Venezuela. I mean, if you're going to interfere and criticize a country's electoral process, you should at least have a better one in your country. The fact that the American empire is critical of Venezuelan elections when it can't even figure out how to make its own elections work is laughable. For an entire week, Iowa was trying to figure out what the results of the caucus were. The major problem with the Iowa caucus is the app that was used, but to make reporting easier for all the precincts. That would be cross-checks with all the counts and the images to ensure that there were no inconsistencies. But the app was crashing every time results were being entered, and they weren't registering any of these results, and there were a large amount of inconsistencies showing three different results. And I'm pretty sure one of them said George McGovern won in Iowa. Results were delayed for days, and the missing results were coming from precincts where Bernie was polling very, very well. And that's no surprise, because the Bernie camp collected all their data and projected that Bernie won by at least 5%. Now, I get it, right? It's biased to Bernie because it's his camp, but it did line up with the small amount of results that were being projected. Now, Bernie and his campaign did not say they won on Monday night, even though they did. They were waiting for the official results to come out. It's like uh, when you know your friend is gay, right? You don't pull them out of the closet. You respectfully wait, and when they finally come out, you say, cool, let's go get ice cream and dish about which boys we think are cute. And, and it's always the boys that look like uh, number two from Star Trek The Next Generation, the superior Star Trek show. I wish all of the candidates had this level of gravitas, though. At 11.34 on, on Monday night, Mayor Pete tweeted out the following statement. Iowa, you've shocked the nation. By all indication, we are going to New Hampshire victorious. Hashtag Iowa caucuses. Which indications? A small amount of reports that came out to point that Mayor Pete isn't winning? I mean, some of the projections had him as low as third. 
I mean, sure, bronze does get to stand with the winners, but that doesn't mean you won. The only thing that's shocking is how bold of liars the DNC and Mayor Pete have become. Now, there is a reason why this is a big deal, and not just a a dumb tweet sent by a dumb mayor that's running for president. Mayor Pete's campaign made a hefty investment in the app that was used in the Iowa caucuses. The app, very aptly named Shadow Inc., was developed by two former DNC campaign managers. And really, that's what you decided to name it? I mean, who came up with that? A marketing firm named Irony LLC? Shadow Inc. Sound like, sounds like America just corporatized darkness. Right? The Washington Post was right. Democracy does die in the dark. You know, the Democratic Party hacks created Shadow to kill the democratic process right in front of our eyes and pretend it was in the shadows with wordplay. Maybe WAPO was just trying to confess and we didn't get it. You know, Shadow's tagline is, when a light is shining, shadows are a constant companion. What fucking horror movie did you steal that from? I mean, this is what the ultra-religious serial killers say to their victims before they eat their eyes. Now, Mayor Pete's campaign threw down close to $43,000 on the app for security and subscription services. Which, according to them, means that they were just trying to contact voters through the app. It's like Biden saying he sniffs the head of children because he's a big fan of Jimmy John's and their free smells policy. Not only that, but the, uh, a major funder to Mayor Pete is a financier of Shadow. Billionaire Seth Clareman, a pro-Israeli settlement businessman who has directly funded Mayor Pete's campaign, also funded the development of the app that has thrown the mild-mannered state of Iowa into chaos. But Seth Clareman isn't the only billionaire backing up Mayor Pete's campaign. The mayor from South Bend has about 40 billionaires and their spouses that have supported him financially, and 13 of them give him money directly. You know, with all these candidates that take billionaires' money, I have to wonder, do billionaires' genitals taste better than that of the middle class? I mean, it's literally the billion-dollar question. I'd like to make a new rule. If you take more than one billionaire's money, then you can't ask the American middle class to help you with your campaign. You either represent real Americans or the billionaire class that exploit us. And after his fake victory speech, Mayor Pete took to Twitter again and said, Right off the stage here in Iowa, incredible night, incredible result, such phenomenal energy. We are headed to New Hampshire victorious. And now we got to build for the next phase. And then Pete asks us all for money to help us help them get to the next stage. I mean, why would you pay somebody to constantly lie to you? But that's the status quo promise of neoliberals like Mayor Pete. It's not to stand for the American people, but to ensure we think we're voting for our interests only to have them backfire on us with blatant lies and deception. Democracy isn't dying in the dark. It's dying right in front of our eyes, in the daylight. We just need to keep our eyes open to see it. But billionaires aren't the only one putting their chips into the peat basket. A variety of CIA directors and spooks, as well as defenders of the Patriot Act and members of the USAID, have been backing the the mayor for as long as his campaign has been alive. As Gray Zone reported, David S. Cohen, the former CIA director under uh, Obama and a Bush-era Treasury official, has endorsed Mayor Pete. Cohen has been nicknamed the sanction guru because he orchestrated the plans to put sanctions on Iran, Russia, and North Korea, apparently while doing hot yoga in a briefing room. And if we remember that the USAID is known to fund coups in various countries that have led to a ton of violence and overthrowing legally elected governments. 
they are behind pushing Guan Guaido's false presidency and funding his political opposition, which included acts of quote-unquote protests such as Guaido mooning Venezuelans. So, why are all these champions of regime change and coups putting their support behind Mayor Pete? Many independent journalists have reported the lack of a foreign policy plan from Mayor Pete, despite him being a Navy veteran. So he's a blank slate for the regime change policies of the empire. Because Mayor Pete doesn't really have a strong foreign policy plan or any plan, really, these former CIA spooks and directors of regime change and members of the USAID and World Bank support him to keep the empire running as they need it to to use economic sanctions as warfare to cripple countries whose resources have deemed is like our global manifest destiny. Mayor Pete is the blank slate of neoliberal imperialism that will smile and wave into a camera as needed. He is as empty as his victory in Iowa. From calling his own victory without any results and to backing the empire's top regime change officials and the billionaire class backing him up, the South Bend mayor has earned the nickname Mayor Pete Guaido. And is this really who we want leading our country? Someone who is just as impetuous, if not more, than Donald Trump? I mean, he called out his own victory without any results, on Twitter. That's the Trumpiest thing you could do. I mean, the Indiana mayor is proving that he's a mix of Trumpian impatience and a Pensian imperialistic bootlicking. He effectively tried to regime change the Iowa caucus. If this is how he's treating Iowa, imagine how he's going to treat the rest of the world. What if he decides to say that he's the czar of Iran and announces it on Instagram, and then causes an international incident. That's not presidential. It's objectively idiotic. This shadow app is showing that the Democratic Party doesn't care about running legal and fair elections, but rather an election that they can hack and determine, making a sham out of the democratic process. The Des Moines Register said that the app was a potential target for election interference. And they're right, but not by Russia or something out of a spy movie, but rather the Democratic establishment elites. In fact, the director of Homeland Security Cyber Division said that Shadow wasn't secure and shouldn't be used for electoral purposes. And it's failed all of the stress tests. And during the test, the app started crying and then called everyone's mom a stupid bitch, which is uncalled for even when you're under stress. Okay, don't bring my mom into this asshole. Matt Blaze, the professor of computer science and IT at Georgetown University, said there are too many problems with an app-based tallying. Aside from the security issue, it depends on the network, the connectivity, and the phone of the user. I mean, rest assured that Android users will not be able to use this app properly, and Apple will definitely charge you $1.99. I mean, for that price, you know, it better be able to fund universal health care. And in Iowa, there's definitely going to be network issues. A few years back, I was in Colfax, Iowa, which is about 30 minutes outside Des Moines, and couldn't connect to the internet to save my life. I couldn't load Facebook, let alone porn. I mean, there must be a lot of sexually repressed teenagers in Colfax. If people are giving up on buffering porn, uh, what makes you think they'll wait patiently to vote or tally digitally? And then there were complaints and issues with the Shadow app that the developer said weren't really a big deal because they were just reporting issues. It wasn't a hack or a security breach. In other words, it's working as it should. But this this reporting issue, it's just not giving us the fabricated numbers we want to see. The app is disastrous in more ways than one. 
Mayor Pete Guaido gaffed and claimed himself victorious because the app that his campaign and his billionaire backers paid for was going to make sure that he would win. But had Bernie actually won immediately, they'd claim that the security of the app was jeopardized and Russia had red-donned our voting system. And that's kind of what happened. At 97% reporting, Bernie Sanders was leading Mayor Pete Guaido by roughly 2,500 voters. Eventually, the report showed that Sanders beat Pete Guaido by 6,000 voters. So because of this, Senator Sanders declared himself victorious from New Hampshire. But the DNC chairman, Tom Perez, claimed that they need to re-canvas to assure public trust. Well, maybe if you didn't rob Bernie Sanders of the primary in 2016, and then in 2020, try to use an untested, unsecure app that was paid by millionaires and a neoliberal pro-regime change blank slate candidate, we trust you more, Perez. And... Not only that, there were also reports that specifically from Black Hawk County, where Bernie won, about 7% of his votes were just given to Deval Patrick, the former Massachusetts governor, who nobody knows is even running. Listen, DNC, this is not how socialism works. We're not sharing votes here. Maybe you shouldn't try to use something you don't understand, okay? Don't try to use socialism or democracy. You know, just sit quietly in the corner with a dunce cap on and recite the numbers in order, you know, to prove that everyone can count properly and and you're not going to get stressed out by just basic counting skills. Eventually, the Democrats gave the votes back to Bernie and pretended like none of it happened at all. The Democratic Party and their establishment elites are starting to sound like an abusive ex that claims that they'll change, but then burns a portion of the house down. Again, look, fool us once, shame on us. Fool us twice, and the revolution will redistribute your wealth first, Perez. Guess who's getting health care for Christmas? It's the American people because it's what we fucking deserve. And the establishment fears a Bernie victory. Shadow was developed by former Clinton and Obama staffers, funded by billionaires that back centrist candidates, and none of these people will be hired to work in any capacity under a Sanders administration. The circle jerk revolving door of nepotism and neoliberalism will be blocked when Bernie Sanders becomes president. And not only that, but at this point, the animosity between the Bernie campaign and the DNC is at an all time high because, as I mentioned earlier, the Sanders camp ran their own numbers with their own app, which worked better. And when they were reporting at only 60% of the results, it still had Bernie in the lead. But the caucus process itself is a huge mess and related to arbitrary math. Despite having a 6,000 voter lead, Sanders was behind by 0.1% of the delegates somehow. So the way the delegate process works is you take the number of people that want to vote for a candidate and multiply by the number of delegates, which is randomly assigned to each precinct, and then you divide that by the total number of people in that caucus, and that'll give you how many delegates each precinct gets, or each candidate gets in that precinct. If that sounds mildly insane and a misuse of math, you're absolutely correct. Look, the notion of a caucus is not an actual vote, but rather saying who you'd vote for, right? It's a popularity contest because when you want a functioning democracy, you should pick the popular cool kid and not the most qualified candidate for the job. But in this case, the most popular candidate is the most qualified candidate. And honestly, I've seen high school prom votes run more efficiently than the Democratic Party in Iowa. The number of delegates are chosen at random. The math is random. The functionality of the app to streamline the process is also random. America doesn't have a fair election. We have a gamified one. And the cards are all stacked against anyone that wants to support we the people. Got some awesome shows coming up here. 
uh, February 11th, Boulder Coffee in Rochester, New York. February 15th, Third Street Gallery in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. February 17th, Maggie Myers Irish Pub in Huntsville, Alabama. February 20th, Bookmarks at Springfield, Missouri. February 21st, Nomads in Fayetteville, Arkansas. February 22nd, Black Apple Crossing in Springdale, Arkansas. February 25th, Andy's Bar in Denton, Texas. February 26th, at the 51st Street Speakeasy in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. And I've got two shows in Texas that I'm opening for my good friend Lee Camp. February 28th at the Deep Ellum Art Company in Dallas, Texas. And February 29th at Kick Butt Cafe in Austin, Texas. You can also um, go check out my entire tour schedule on my website, ramennoodlescomedy.com. It's R-A-M-A-N noodlescomedy.com. Uh, you can also become a patron there, do an ind- individual donation, just like a one-time donation if you would like to, uh, patreon.com slash krishmohanhaha. Tons of goals, tons of rewards. Uh, it includes exclusive tracks, early access to the, to the multi-part uh, Fork Full of Noodles episodes that will uh, that'll be coming out. I've got a bunch that I've got planned for this year. Um, as well as uh, some of the tiers include free tickets to come see my live stand-up comedy shows. Uh, so make sure, make sure you check that out. And uh, like I said, uh, my throat is not uh, at, its, at its optimal capacity right now. So uh, the episode is a little bit wobbly, a little bit wonky, and I apologize for that. Um, but... Uh, thank you guys for checking it out. Thank you guys for tuning in. 